Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our second webinar, a part of our Patient Ambassador Program. My name is Lauren. I'm the Executive Director of the Chris Kluge Foundation, and I'll be introducing you to today's moderator and panelists. I'd like to first thank our sponsor, Novartis. If you're new to GoWebinar, you'll notice that you have a box to field questions to the panelists on your console. We will be going through a brief Q&A at the end of the presentation, so we want to encourage you to type your questions into the chat as they come to mind. You'll also notice a button to raise your hand. Please only use this if you want to ask your question over the microphone rather than typing in the message. If we see a raised hand, that will be our signal to unmute your microphone when we get to your question. We also will be doing a comprehensive follow-up, so sending in your questions will help us answer anything we don't have time to get to. Now, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Jordan Sandbach. Jordan is a transplant mother and caregiver to her almost four-year-old son and liver transplant recipient, Hudson. After being diagnosed with biliary atresia just days after his birth, Hudson received a liver transplant at nine months old via a living donor, his uncle, Trevor Hill, a United States Army Colonel and Jordan's brother-in-law. Today, Jordan is an active advocate for living donation and serves as a leader in the parent, family, and engaged partners group of SPLIT, Society of Pediatric Liver Transplantation, and a parent voice advocate for the Starsville Network. Thanks, Jordan. Harold Mintz. In December 2000, Harold donated his kidney to a stranger and became one of the first non-designated living do organ donors in the United States. Today, almost 20 years later, both donor and kidney recipient are alive and thriving. Following his donation experience, Harold has become an advocate for organ, living organ donation, participating in speaking engagements and awareness efforts around the country. Thanks, Harold. Sean Elliott. Sean was the first professional athlete to return to competition after an organ transplant. He has played for the Antonio Spears against the Atlanta Hawks on March 13, 2000. A native of Tucson, Arizona, Sean spent 11 of his 12 seasons playing for San Antonio. During March of the 1998-99 season, Sean was told to prepare himself for a kidney transplant. He continued to play and kept his condition a secret. He contributed to the team throughout the playoffs as the Spurs defeated the New York Knicks in five games to win their first NBA championship. Shortly after the championship run, Sean underwent surgery and received a kidney from his older brother, Noel. Sean announced his retirement in 2001 and became a basketball analyst for the Spurs local broadcast, a position he still retains today. Dr. Sanjay Kalkarni. Dr. Kalkarni is a multi-organ transplant surgeon director of the kidney transplant program and medical director of the Center for Living Organ Donors at Yale University and Yale New Haven Hospital. The kidney transplant program at Yale has been one of the largest programs in New England since 2008. In terms of living organ donor transplants, new patients listed and the total number of kidney transplants performed. In addition, Dr. Carl Carney serves as a scientific director of the Yale Transplant Research Unit and is principal investigator on numerous cl clinical research trials focused on improving living donation. Dr. Kalkarni is also the United Network for Organ Sharing, UNOS, primary living donor surgeon. And last but not least, your moderator for the webinar, liver transplant recipient, Olympian, and founder of the Chris Klug Foundation, Chris Klug. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks for the great introduction. Thank you, uh, Harold, Sean, Jordan, and Dr. Polkarni for joining us today for our conversation. This is our second uh, Chris Klug Foundation Ambassador Tour event. And uh, again, the, the hope today is to have a great conversation, uh, catch up with some transplant community friends, uh, and to, uh, like everything that CKF does, try to help inspire those that are going through the same thing um, that. Uh, Sean and uh, and uh, Harold and, and Jordan and Dr. Gokarni does every day um, and myself uh, and also hopefully help uh, provide some insights into uh, making that process a little bit easier. Uh, I'll share just for a minute with my story and then uh, love to uh, open it up to each of our panelists to, in their own words, kind of share their 
uh, transplant experience, their connection to the transplant community. Um, I celebrated this summer 20 years since my life-saving liver transplant after about uh, almost six years on a transplant waiting list and grateful to still be here. I'm actually on vacation for a couple of days at the beach with my family and uh, loving, um, you know, that second chance at life. I'm way healthier, way stronger than I ever was before my transplant. And uh, as I said, grateful to still be here and intent on living every single day to its absolute fullest and making the most of this second chance at life. Uh, after six years on a waiting list almost, I got to say it was uh, a very precarious place to be. I'm often asked that question, what's the recovery like from a liver transplant? Well, it's not easy bouncing back from any transplant, but I have to say in comparison to the waiting list game, it was much easier. I had a miraculous recovery. I was out of the hospital uh, four days later, back on a stationary bike about a week later and riding my bicycle again about seven weeks later. So um, it, it was a, a miraculous recovery and certainly grateful to my transplant team, to my donor family, of course, Billy Flood, my donor and his family for making a heroic and selfless decision at uh, what was not an easy time for uh, his family. They decided to save my life and three others, a complete stranger. And I'm here today because of, as I said, his heroic decision and, and that of his family. I uh, got to compete and represent our country in the 98 Olympics, where I was actually on a transplant waiting list. And just a year and a half after my life-saving liver transplant, I got to return to my second Red Olympic Games in Salt Lake City in 2002, which was, without a doubt, two of the best weeks of my life. Uh, I won my bronze medal there and, and got to show the world what's possible after a transplant. And as I said, I, I selfishly love riding my mountain bike. I love riding my kiteboard and surfboard and snowboard and, and doing all these activities that I'm passionate about. But it's also fun to show the world what's possible after a transplant and, and to share with other transplant candidates and transplant recipients uh, some of my mountaineering uh, activities and exploits and, and snowboarding activities and show them what's possible because so often I'll, I'll share my bronze medal with somebody. And, and that's the best thing about a bronze medal is you get to share it. But uh, I'll, I'll share some of my activities with somebody and they say, wait, you had a liver transplant? I thought that was a death sentence or I didn't realize you could live a, a quality active lifestyle after a transplant. I say, you bet you can. And there's, uh, there's nothing I can't do today. So very grateful for my second chance and, and thankful that all of you have joined us today to help share your inspiring words and, and help others uh, through this Chris Klug Foundation Ambassador Panel Tour discussion. So on that note, um, Jordan, I'll start with you. If I can uh, pass it over to you and you can uh, share a couple words on uh, your connection to the transplant community and, uh, and a little bit of your story in your own words before I ask some specific questions. Awesome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so our story is we actually are kind of unique where we found out um, that something was kind of unique with Hudson um, at my 20 week ultrasound. So he had what's called heterotaxy, which just means that his organs weren't necessarily in the right place. So I was monitored throughout my pregnancy. And we knew that when Hudson was born, um, that he was going to be in the hospital. He was going to be inpatient in the NICU just so that they could see if heterotaxy had any impact on his health because they didn't know. Um, so Hudson was born and we were in the NICU and they just noticed that something wasn't quite right. Um, he, he wasn't gaining any weight um, and he had light colored stool. So um, they actually went in for an exploratory surgery um, to check his intestines. Um, and they noticed that his liver just wasn't looking quite right. Um, so they did a biopsy and we did um, a HIDA scan um, and he was diagnosed with biliary atresia um, at about seven weeks old. Um, and he was completely missing his bile ducts. So all the bile in his liver, it wasn't going anywhere. So it was backing up and it was damaging his liver. Um, so he had a procedure called a Kasai. And what that is, is they attach the liver directly to your intestine. So they try to bypass that bile duct. So he had that surgery at seven weeks old and um, they pretty much knew right away that it was a failure. So he didn't, Hudson wasn't getting any better. Um, and they just waited um, to see if he would bounce back from that surgery. 
Well, in January, um, so when Hudson was about three months old, um, he actually went into septic shock and we were, we were hospitalized. And unfortunately, when you're sick, if you get sick again, it kind of accelerates any kind of liver failure. So when Hudson was three months old, he was listed, um, he was officially listed for transplant. And the cool thing about that is as soon as Hudson was listed, um, his uncle Trevor, so my brother-in-law, actually was on the phone immediately and was like, I'm, I'm going to be his, um, his donor. So he was listed at the begin, or excuse me, at the end of January, and Trevor was approved to be his perfect match um, at the beginning of February. So that process was pretty quick. Um, so knowing that we had a liver um, a donor, we actually were able to spend the next couple of months trying to get Hudson as big as possible for his surgery, um, just so that the surgery could possibly go a little smoother. Um, and then um, Trevor actually had to do a deployment in Afghanistan for 30 days prior to um, going into surgery and donating his liver. So in July, after Trevor came back from his deployment, um, they, Trevor actually had his um, surgery at the University of Washington and Hudson had his surgery at Seattle Children's. Um, so that happened on July 7th. Um, Trevor was actually, he was discharged within four days, kind of like you, Chris. <laughs> um, he was discharged in four days and he did stay in Seattle for two weeks um, just to make sure that everything went well with him um, as the donor. Um, Hudson was in the hospital for about 40 days, just they needed to kind of figure out his body needed to find its right place, right? So um, we were in the hospital for about 40 days, but then we were discharged and honestly, he's he's been great since. We've had you know a couple of bumps along the road, but um, he's turning four at the end of this month and it's it's been great like to everything that you said in terms of the second chance at life it's just been honestly a gift to witness that's awesome jordan congratulations and congratulations to hudson how's trevor doing is he back uh serving again yep yep so he um right now he is the command um, colonel of the rotc program um and he's based at fort bragg in um, Fayetteville, North Carolina, and he's doing well. You literally, like, he barely has a scar, and <laughs> you wouldn't know that he ever did anything like donate. Um, and he's actually a little shy about it, so you have to. <laughs> he won't. He won't necessarily. Um, he loves talking about it with people and advocating for organ donation. But um, if you like ask to see your scar or something, he's like, "Oh, you know about that? Okay." <laughs> Well, tell him not to be shy. It's uh, the most expensive tattoo in the world and uh, <laughs> certainly a message that we need to continue to get out there to everybody. Thanks, Jordan, for uh, sharing your introduction there and uh, for sharing your story in your own words. I'd like to pass the mic now to Harold. Harold's been a, a great friend of Chris Klug Foundation and uh, a great advocate for organ donation awareness. Uh, and you're on the on the other side of the uh, transplant matter uh, as an altruistic uh, donor. And I'd love to hear your story for just a few minutes in your own words, Harold. Well, sure. Uh, usually the first thing that comes up when someone hears that I donated a kidney uh, and then they find out I gave it to someone I didn't know, they oftentimes say, gee, I can never do something like that, which always cracks me up because we're dealing with me I did this almost 20 years ago, this December, it will be 20 years. Uh, and I tell people all the time, nobody wakes up one day and says, I'm gonna give away body parts today. That It doesn't just happen like a light switch. Uh, and so for me, speaking with you guys today, uh, it's it reminds me of how I ended up on the surgeon's table in the first place because little events throughout most of my life from high school to reading a magazine article, to meeting somebody at an airport, to watching a movie on a plane, little insignificant events that at the time didn't register. But inside my head, it's like there's a scale and I keep putting these little pieces of information on it. And eventually when enough information pushed that scale, it got me to start asking questions. So uh, I didn't say, hey, Maybe I could help somebody and give give a kidney away. That wasn't it at all. Uh, but I do tell people, if the same things that I experienced 
a father who passed away early and meeting the people I met and seeing what I read at the times that I saw them. If that had happened to you, I strongly believe that you might very well have ended up on that surgeon's table as well. So <clears throat> 20 years ago, uh, not a lot of people were raising their hands and saying, uh, I want to give to whoever needs it the most. And so 20 years ago, uh, they wouldn't take it from me at first. Uh, <laughs> they, you know, they, there's got to be something wrong with them. So they sent me to psychiatrists and a bunch of other kind of fun things. Uh, but eventually I got through the, uh, the network of uh, the filter that they set up to try to stop, you know, something bad from happening and uh, ended up donating. And three months after surgery, uh, the recipient and I were allowed to meet. And I laughed by saying, you couldn't find two more completely opposite people if you tried. It's comically opposite. I'm a tall, white, uh, loud uh, male. My recipient is an Ethiopian, uh, tiny black woman who barely talks above a whisper. He's the most serious Christian I've ever met. I don't want the lightning to hit our connection here, but I question the big G's existence. I mean, in every possible way, we are opposites on, in everything. And yet we are as close to being family today as I am with my, my I can't say blood family because my blood is in her uh, at this point. But uh, I, re I share the story because by the fact that I'm with you today, somebody could hear this. I don't know it, but somebody could hear this and it could be a grain, one little grain of sand for them to move one step closer to asking questions. So anything I can do to help and answer questions, I'm all over it. I love it, Harold. Thank you so much. That's amazing. Uh... You talk about how different you and your recipient are, and yet we're brought together by this gift of life and and uh, the transplant process. And it's, it's amazing. as close so, to a happily ever after story as you're going to find. I'm telling you, it's it's odd, but boy, we're both doing so well now. Twenty years later, it's good. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks, uh, Sean. Your turn. You were a huge inspiration when I was preparing for my liver transplant in the final weeks and uh, months of the transplant waiting game. And I remember calling you uh, up. We got connected through our mutual friend, David Robinson, who was a uh, Aspenite there for a while and um, had an opportunity to speak with you early on as I was on the waiting list. And I said, Sean, how are the anti-rejection drugs and can I get through this? And you said, you can do it. And I remember just hanging up the phone right after that and saying, Sean, that's all I needed to hear. I don't need to hear anything else. And just <laughs> possible. And uh, you were a huge inspiration to me. And, and I know you've uh, been an inspiration to so many people that um, have gone through this like both of us and uh, really appreciate all you do to give back to the transplant community. So if, if uh, for a few minutes, you can share your experience and your story in your own words, that'd be awesome. Yeah, well, thank you for that, Chris. That that means a lot. And uh, <clears throat> you know, I uh, initially when I set out on this journey, uh, which wasn't voluntary, uh, you know, I wasn't, uh, you know, I was trying to prove something to myself at first, but I also thought that I can inspire people. And you know, what happened to me? Uh, my my story uh, really goes back to my childhood because I had high blood pressure since the very first physical. Uh, in junior high school or high school, and it kind of went untreated for for years, and it came to a head in uh, 1993 after that season. Uh, we had lost in the playoffs, and I remember for the next two weeks, I just had trouble getting out of bed, and <clears throat> I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. I lost my appetite, my hands. Uh, I'd wake up in the morning, and my hands were so swollen. I was had a tough time figuring out, but finally, it sent me to the doctor. Is, I woke up one morning and I could barely open my eyes because my face was so swollen. So I ended up going to the doctor. Uh, I took some you know, urine tests and he called me back and he said, hey, something's uh, up with you. Uh, and so my journey began there. At the, at the time, they thought that I had what's called minimal change disease. They took a biopsy of my kidney. Uh, they looked at it and they said, hey, there's not much change. We don't know, uh, you know what's going on here. And then I was put on a, a regimen of drugs and you know, start out with 80 milligrams a day of prednisone. 
that was uh, pretty rough on me for a couple months. Uh, but my creatinine dropped. It was at 4.5 at that time. It dropped. And so the next six years or so, I played with my creatinine fluctuating between 2.5 and 4 for the most part. Uh, and I was able to play. Now, there are lots of nights I'd go out there, Chris, and uh, uh, so many nights where I'd uh, walking to center court for jump ball and I could feel fluid in my legs. You know, I could feel an extra uh, something in my groin and my calf muscles. There was just extra liquid. And so I retained a lot of water, but you know, I was able to go out there and play. So I was, I was just pleased that I, you know, I wasn't um, debilitated. But in 99, uh, coming down the stretch uh, toward the playoffs, I noticed that uh, I was feeling a lot more fatigued. Um, I was starting to lose my appetite again. I was waking up five or six times in the middle of the night uh, just to, to go to the bathroom. And so I uh, finally went in to see the doctor again. I had regular checkups, but I uh, hadn't seen the doctor in uh, three or four months. So I went in and my creatinine had spiked to over seven. It was about seven and a half. At that time, my nephrologist, uh, I had a great nephrologist, Dr. Reinick. He told me, hey, you got to start thinking about a transplant. But we were right there. We were having the best season maybe that we'd ever had. And he said, hey, I want to take a biopsy. You're going to be out two weeks. I said, there's no way I'm going to do that. Uh, you know, I don't want to draw any questions or uh, any uh, awareness to me. I just want to keep going. Um, let's take care of this after the playoffs. So they would take uh, blood tests periodically. Uh, the guys in the locker room were always wondering what was going on with me because the doctors were, they took my blood pressure before the game, at halftime, and after the game. So they were wondering why I had to go in the training room at halftime and doctors were putting a cuff on me to check on me to make sure I'm not going to, you know, something bad's not going to happen to me during the game, you know. So at the end of that uh, season, <clears throat> I remember actually getting back from New York after we beat the Knicks in the finals. I went in for an ultrasound on my kidneys and a blood test. My creatinine was nine and a half, basically 9.6. And the um, radiologist who gave me the ultrasound said that my kidneys uh, were so necrotic that they had a hard time finding them. They had shrunken up so much. And so uh, for me, obviously at that point, I had to start the process of finding a donor. So I talked to my family. Uh, we all went in and got our blood drawn. My dad is act was actually a medical technician, so he drew the whole family's blood. Uh, my brother Noel ended up being almost a perfect match. My mother was a little bit of a match, but she was older. Um, and my brother Noel was uh, marked uh, was uh, positive in five out of six markers. And so uh, I remember the phone call. I called him. I said, "Hey, you know, you're almost a perfect match, and uh, you know, what do you think?" And he said, "I was born to do this." And, and so, you know, that was really, yeah, it was just inspiring. And so, you know, I was able to get the transplant in August of 99. And uh, a lot of what you said was true for me. It was like somebody flipped a light switch on. I didn't realize how sick I had become throughout the years and so uh, how much energy I had lost. So my first couple of weeks out of the hospital, I was trying to run stairs. You know, the doctor was like, hey, you know, you got to take it easy. And I was trying to do too much that was my problem and and so you said you were on your stationary bike I was trying to walk or run stairs trying to get my breath back uh, because I was determined that I was going to come back and play and so I think both we both had that kind of mindset where we're a little bit crazy like that because uh you know that's the only way we could get to where uh, we were in the first place and, and so uh I was just determined that this wasn't going to beat me I was going to prove to myself that I could overcome uh, this disease and make it back and play and uh, hopefully inspire some people and give some people some hope along the way. And and I, I just want to say, uh, <clears throat> you know, I was able to come back and play in March of 2000, but I wasn't able to do that without obviously uh, the donation from my brother. And, and when I hear Harold's story and I and I know about what my brother did and know know what he went through, you know, those are the real heroes. To me, I mean, I you know, people tell me things and they say, "Hey, you're a hero to me," and I, you know, I appreciate that. That's really nice uh, when people tell me uh, things like that. But the real heroes to me are the guys like Harold and my brother Noel, who you know were just selfless and made an incredible sacrifice to uh, to get 
you know, guys like me back out there. So uh, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, I, I'm i like you, Chris. I think, you know, we have the same kind of, uh, maybe it's a type A personality, but, you know, I had to get my workout in today. Uh, I eat right. Uh, I try to be an example for people. And, and, and another thing that I tried to do is I wanted uh, people to look down. I wanted down the road, like when me and my brother are together, uh, if people don't know our story, they would have no idea that I had a kidney transplant. And there are so many times I'm having a discussion or a conversation with somebody, they don't know my history. And I say, well, yeah, I had a kidney transplant in 99. And they kind of look at me like, like I'm just throwing some something out there. You know, like, what's this guy crazy? Did he just say he had a kidney transplant? You know, so it's hard for people to believe. And I like that. I actually like that because I want to be a picture of good health and I want to show people what's possible after a transplant. Well, you're a great example. Thanks for sharing your story. And uh, as I said, inspiring so many. And you're right. Uh, I think you're a real champion for bouncing back. And, and you were the first professional athlete to do it and pave the way for lots of people like myself and Alonzo Mourning, another uh, NBA player, and uh, a lot of people that didn't know it was possible before uh, you did it. So thank you. But you're so right that uh, for every recipient, there's a donor or a donor family that says yes. And without that, you and I aren't here today. So it's uh, exactly right. people like Harold and and so many donors that are the real well, gold members of this whole process. That, uh, donated your, your um, liver. I mean, like you said, uh, those people have to make that decision in a very difficult time in their lives. And for them to make that decision to save lives, it actually keeps, uh, you said Billy Flood, it keeps his legacy going. And it helps, they get to see a person like you or somebody else that they help uh, enjoy their life. Uh, there's gotta be some uh, consolation in that. Uh, so there's gotta be something that brings them joy uh, seeing somebody like you. And it's, uh, th those people are heroes as well. No doubt about it. And I think that's part of, you know, why we give back too, is to honor our donors and uh, really try to, uh, try to continue that to, to help other people that, like I said, are going through the same thing you and I did 20 plus years ago. Yeah. Dr. Kulkarni, I want to uh, pass the microphone to you now. You helped make this whole process possible for, uh, for Hudson and Sean and myself and for uh, donors like Harold and, and so many other heroes like my donor, Billy and Noel, uh, Sean's donor. You make this all possible. So thanks for joining us today and love to hear how you got into all this and uh, why this is such a special field. Well, I think what you've heard from the other panelists is that living donation is a very emotional thing, right? So, uh, and that's exactly why I ended up going into it. So it was a convergence of a lot of different things uh, during my training in the 90s. Uh, but it was actually simply seeing these individuals who were willing to undergo risk for the benefit of somebody else and taking care of them. I found that just incredibly driving uh, you sort of want to emulate and sort of want to, it sort of inspire you to do more. Uh, that coincided with actually the uh, advent of laparoscopic donor nephrectomy. So just so if you everyone uh, understands, conventionally when people wanted to donate a kidney, there'd be a large incision on the side. That was very the most common way that people would donate a kidney. And unfortunately back then, um, if you were the kidney donor, your recovery was actually worse than the recipient because they may have to take a portion of the rib and so forth. But I sort of came to age in surgery with laparoscopy where you make some small incisions in the abdomen and, and you put a camera and you basically do the entire dissection through maybe three or four incisions like this. And then you make a small incision like this just to remove the kidney. Uh, and right when I was becoming an attending or, or getting my first job, that was getting more and more popular. Chris, as you probably know, that is now being uh, more, uh, it's more common liver as well. So there are centers that are utilizing that exact same thing. And what, what that translates into is much quicker recovery time for the donor. Uh, they do far better. It's like one to two day hospital stay. They're back in recovery. So that's really why I was compelled to do it. Um, First and foremost, is more the emotional connection with the donors. I, I think it's a little selfish on my part, but just dealing with donors all the time, 
and meeting individuals who are willing to do that is is just inspiring. And then later on in my career, um, you know, I've been in practice now for 17 years. I've fundamentally shifted to understand that living donation is really the solution to the health crisis for people with living who who suffer from liver and kidney disease. I mean, if you look at the outcomes of individuals who get living donors, they do better. There's obviously far less waiting time from the time uh, a donor's approved and recipient's approved, often like four or six weeks, comparing that to, you know, kidneys, which can be up to five to seven years, or a liver patient who may have to get even sicker to get a liver transplant. You simply can't compare deceased donation to living donation. Uh, and then lastly, uh, the philosophy we've really tried to take at Yale is uh, we can fix this health crisis, right? So if you look at Connecticut, where we reside, um, if you look at the combined population of people in need of a liver or kidney transplant in our state, it's around 2,000, right? 2,000 to 2,200. We have 3.2 million people in our state, right? So uh, yes, not everyone can be a donor. Um, we are we have very strict criteria, but this is a fixable problem for our country. Uh, we just have to do it responsibly, ethically, and with the long-term interests of living donors at heart. So that's what really has been inspiring me. That's why we've set up uh, our Center for Living Organ Donors to try to create a framework that is responsible and ethical uh, where we can both help patients and fix this health crisis. Well, good for you. Thanks for the great work you're doing to help so many people in the Chance Bank community get a second chance, just like uh, myself. I know uh, Yale New Haven uh, Health is extremely dedicated to promoting living donation through your center of uh, living organ donors. How do you identify and initially, how did you initially develop the program and, and identify it? Well, first came to the the conclusion, like I mentioned before, that we think it was the conclusion that the solution to the health crisis. But one of the gaps that we saw is that uh, there was no program that was really invested in the sort of the long-term engagement of living donors. So um, from a government perspective, you're required to follow living donors for two years. So you see them at six months, one year and two year, you get some laboratory testing, you do a health survey. But unfortunately, there's never been any sort of long-term commitment for living donors. Uh, and we thought, that that if we're going to promote living donation as a solution, we at the very least needed to develop a program where we had the long-term interests of living donors at the foundational basis of this program. So very unique, uh, the president of the hospital at that time, Dr. Rick Dequilla, uh, was, was instrumental in, in, in proving this, but we offer free laboratory testing and screening for all our living donors in perpetuity. The cost is actually very little, but the benefits are huge, right? So you try to identify individuals who may have early high blood pressure, may have some blood pressure issues, um, and then try to mitigate it. It's not free health insurance. Uh, it's actually just a screening program, but it provides two separate things. It provides us the ability to re-engage donors, maintain their health, and get them help if they need it. But secondly, all donors are advocates. So one of the things I've recognized is that living donors are certainly advocates for the recipients, right? Or they could be an advocate for the society at large when they come forward to be a altruistic donor. Um, however, many of them feel compelled to do something more. And what we try to do is create a platform where we can try to share their stories. Uh, so people in the general population understand that, hey, this person donated looks really pretty okay, right? They're like a normal person. And then try to inspire people through their stories about giving and what that meant to them. And Doc, how has your guys' success uh, affected, or I should say, how has that impacted uh, other programs and the work they're doing with living donation? I think the transplant community at large, uh, the safe and ethical expansion of living donation is something that is has become a priority. And I think, um, I just don't think I know. So, you know, through several decades, the transplant community spent a lot of money in getting people to uh, register for a deceased donor. So when you go to the 
DMV, you register as a donor and, and that's good, but there's never been a sort of an organized national effort to get the word out about living donation, right? Uh, for whatever reason. Uh, it's not a criticism, it's just something that just hasn't happened. But what we've realized is that because the outcomes are so better with living donation, that we need to try to identify ways to decrease barriers for living donation. So for example, um, you know, as you probably know in our country, you can't pay somebody to be a living donor, um, but maybe there are ways to make it at the very least cost neutral, right? So a, a living donor should not have to suffer any financial burdens, medical burdens, or things like that. That's the least we can do. Uh, and, and the transplant community is certainly working with that. Um, and then secondly, try to create a framework where, at, I can't emphasize this enough, the long-term health of living donors is monitored and maintained, right? There are living donors who donate who end up having health problems down the road. But it's important to recognize that oftentimes these health problems occur because things aren't diagnosed quickly. So it's not necessarily like high blood pressure or diabetes that will cause kidney disease. It's actually the untreated, undiagnosed high blood pressure and diabetes that will cause kidney disease. So if we can develop a, a structure where we can maintain health, try to identify individuals uh, in need early, we can mi mitigate a lot of these long-term risks that currently exist. Great, well, thanks for the great work you're doing. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks for the invite. Jordan, I want to ask you, uh, uh, back to Jordan, when you found out that Hudson uh, would need a liver transplant, was living donation presented to you as a first option? It was, you know, we were actually presented both at the same time during the transplant evaluation. Um, but kind of what was unique about our situation is we knew we knew that we were headed for transplant even before Hudson's Kasai and everything. So we were able to do some research on our own and we had already um, started having conversations with Trevor about living donation. And we, we joke that um, Trevor Vaughn told us that <laughs> this was the direction that we were going to go, um, which we were on the same page, we were on board, but ultimately, um, and this is something that's kind of unique with pediatrics is um, Hudson's doctors and, and during the transplant evaluation, they're focused on Hudson, right? They, they're they focused on his health and his um, and what they can do to make sure that he has the best outcome. Um, so living donation was it was mentioned to us, but it wasn't necessarily um gone into great lengths or um, they didn't really go into tons of detail and that's really because um, all of that happens from a donor perspective at the university of washington so a lot of hospitals around the country children's hospitals around the country um, they don't do it um, they don't do the donor and the recipient surgery at the same time right so a lot of it is at a different facility um, so i think that there's an element um, with pediatrics that the parents do have to be um, a bit more of an advocate and they have to be um, take a little bit more of an initiative um, to look into that living donor. Um, but again, back to our case, we, we knew that this was something that um, we wanted to pursue. And, you know, in speaking with Trevor, we, we wanted to go ahead and do it because it was going to be the best outcome for Hudson so we didn't have to wait as long. And Trevor ultimately said, you know, not only do I want to help Hudson, but I want to help anyone um, potentially on the waiting list by doing this. So we kind of had to take it upon ourselves to do a bit more research. Well, I'll tell you, I couldn't have gotten through my transplant without my family, my parents, my wife, and uh, I had a great support network around me. And that's critical for getting through a, uh, a transplant and the waiting list successfully. I always say you don't win an, an Olympic medal and you don't uh, get through a liver transplant without a great team behind you. Uh, Sean, I want to ask you the same question. Did you know living donation was an option? Uh, and did you look to your brother first? How did you initially broach the subject with him? Hey, by the way, yeah. <laughs> could I borrow one of your kidneys? <laughs> yeah, uh, I knew that it was an option, actually. I knew that living... Uh, donation uh, was an option because I had followed it uh, for a while. Uh, when I was <clears throat> informed that I needed a transplant, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the type of person where I look and research everything. And so, uh, yeah, I was very aware. And, uh, I, you know, I, 
I always thought it would be a family member or, you know, or somebody that was close to me. And, uh, you know, like I said, my, even my mother uh, tested uh, where she was a match for me, but my brother was such a good match. We're only a year and a half apart. And he, we did everything together, Chris, when we were kids. I mean, uh, you know, I was a pitcher in baseball and my brother was a catcher. You know, we, we'd practice at home all the time. You know, my brother, uh, uh, when I was trying to dump for the first time, actually, uh, my brother was the one feeding me the passes so I could step in and try to dunk over and over again. You know, he was always by my side. And so uh, I didn't have a problem asking him, you know, I, I kind of felt, you know, yes, you know, this is a big ask, but at the same time, it wasn't because we're family. And, and if my brother uh, had asked me, I was going to do exactly the same thing for him. You know, there was no if, ands, or buts about it. And so uh, it was a great conversation. And you know, my brother still to this day, he's a poster child for donation. He looks great. Uh, he's in uh, fine physical uh, health. Uh, he's got three kids. He had three kids after the transplant. And so uh, people have no idea, again, that he's a donor. And uh, I mean, he's just as proud as can be. Every time he sees me, he just lights up because he knows that I'm here because of him. Isn't that amazing, the ripple effect of transplantation and donation. My uh, yep. two kids are here today because of my donor, Billy Flood, and, and as I said, his family's heroic decision, and uh, the ripple effect is incredible. Yep. Harold, I want to uh, ask you how you were introduced to the concept of living donation. Uh, it was such an early stage in the development of living donation. Uh, you talked a little bit about what that process was like. They, they asked you uh, for a psychiatric evaluation initially. Uh, but can you talk to us a little bit more about how you were first introduced to living donation and, and what that process was like? Yeah, that's, that's a serious, seriously good question. So I bring this all back to today. There's not a thousand people a day donating to people they don't know, but because of press uh, and stories and social media, it's not as unusual to hear about it. So there's an awareness factor today that didn't really exist 20 years ago. Uh, like I said, it wasn't that I wanted to do this. Uh, I, I I did want to help, and I got to I got to say something. Both Sean and what you, Chris, have both used a word I'm really uncomfortable with. You use the word heroes, and I don't pretend to know from your perspective if I needed something to live in a so. I think I understand why you would say something like that, but there's a big risk using those kinds of words because from my perspective as a donor, I don't look at it that way. I look at it as a very natural decision. And when people use words like heroes to describe a donor, it makes it sound as if only special people, uh, a very select few are able to make that kind of decision. And one of my favorite things, I'm tingling on my arms a little bit as I say this, one of my favorite things about my story is I'm not special. You may think so, or people that hear the story on that day, yeah, I don't minimize it. I did a good thing that day, but I'm as normal as anybody else. I flip people off on the road when they cut me off. I make my mistakes. I do, I do things, but that's my favorite part of the story, that normal people can given the right situation and circumstance, make these incredible decisions to help somebody else. It's not heroic. It seems natural at the time. And so I, uh, for me, awareness, if you know somebody, like if your next door neighbor needed uh, a kidney to survive, they weren't gonna be around next week if you didn't offer your next door neighbor, would you consider doing that? Yes, yeah, some people are gonna say yes, some are gonna say no, but I think there's a heck of a lot more people that would go, Tell me more. Will I have a scar? Will I be able to eat what I want to eat? Will my life expectancy be shortened because I did this kind of thing? So it's just information and awareness. It didn't really exist 20 years ago, but today it's all over social media and it's easy to ask. So I think that's the biggest difference between today and when I donated. Good for you. Thank you, Harold. You know, I often say that uh, I want to ask Jordan as a recipient mom, I often say to my parents, I think it was harder on them than it was on me. You know, I, I knew what I was facing. I was 27 years old. And 
I look at my preparation for my liver transplant and I said, you know, just like when I was racing, I've done everything I can to prepare myself for a successful outcome. Now it's, uh, in my case, I said it's in God's hands and it's in the surgeon's hands and I hope it works out. But whatever happened to me as the patient, my family uh, was going to live with. So what's that perspective like as a, uh, a mother of a recipient going through the whole process? Um, you know, it's the, the word that I always tell people that kind of, I can't really say haunts me, but it's the only way that I know how to describe is it was, I felt helpless, um, through it until, until, um, Trevor was his donor. Um, I, and it was like, officially it was on paper. Everyone was like, this is good to go. He's the perfect match. And, you know, that was the first time that, um, that I was able to kind of take a breath and that helplessness kind of shifted over to, um, I, I was empowered. I kind of felt motivated because I knew that there was light at the end of the tunnel. Right. So it was this, um, this second wind, if you will. Um, and when you have that, I mean, it makes all of the clinical things, it makes all of the medical things. I don't want to say easy to get through, but compared to what I was feeling during, um, you know, when he was super sick and I didn't know if there um, was going to be someone that could donate. So um, it's been, that's the best way I know how to describe it is that motivation, it just makes everything easy and you just go along with it. That's awesome. Um, Sean, I want to go back to you. Uh, I know that uh, for me, when I woke up from my transplant, I remember thinking, oh, that's what it's supposed to feel like. I'd run around with a compromised engine my whole life, and they dropped a brand new, perfectly functioning liver in me. And I woke up and said, I'm going to make it back. I knew right then and there that I obviously had some physical therapy and some recovery and uh, needed to make sure that the anti-rejection drugs worked and no infection. But I knew I was going to make it back. And I, and I woke up and I felt whole for the first time. I do remember another uh, another training incident for me. I finally made it back to my snowboard seven weeks later. I was on Mount Hood in Oregon on the Palmer Snowfield. And uh, I finally jumped back into the race course and made a couple of turns and had a pretty spectacular crash, cartwheeling down the hill. And I got up and I and immediately grabbed my abdomen, making sure that my liver was still intact. <laughs> but there were some things to get used to with this, what we had been through. And I just wonder for you, what was... What were some of the adjustments you had to make and what were some of the challenges and what was maybe the hardest thing bouncing back to not just a quality of life, but to playing in the NBA and playing uh, basketball at a professional level again? Uh, you know, I'm glad you said that because uh, I needed some things to reassure myself that I was back. You know, I had to get in there and I had to mix it up a little bit like you did. And, and so I had several instances. I had uh, a couple scrimmages and a couple games where uh, I took hard shots uh, to my abdominal area uh, that, you know, I had to sit there and say to myself for a second, am I going to be all right? And I was uh, perfectly fine. Uh, and then, you know, I once I was able to get past that mentally, I was really able to, to really just, you know, again, throw myself back in uh, to playing again and, and go kind of with a, a reckless abandon. Uh, but it did take, it was almost like, you know, overcoming any other type of injury where you had to get past the mental part. But I also, uh, Chris, I had, a, a, you know, a little bit of a setback uh, in December of 99. I had my transplant in August, but I had a little bit of a setback in December when I got uh, the flu. I didn't get a flu shot uh, and I should have gotten one. And then that developed into pneumonia. And I was in the, the uh, hospital for about four days. And it was, a, it was an interesting story because when I was trying to come back and play for the team, uh, everybody wanted me to come back. I mean, the, the organization was receptive, but Pop told me, he said, you're gonna have to pass our conditioning test just like everybody else in order to practice. So our conditioning test was, 
uh, it's called a, a, a deep 10. You have to run the length of the court uh, 10 times in a minute. You get a minute rest and you gotta do it again. You have to do that five times. So our conditioning test was invented by this- Not sure uh, I'd pass, buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So this test was invented by this uh, mad scientist. His name is Pat Riley. So they, you know, he's a madman. So when they told me that, I said, well, there, there's no way I'm gonna pass this test, okay? So I was in a, I was traveling with the team. I was calling games. I was in a gym in Indiana and it was cold and I was running and my lungs kind of burned. When I got back home, I just really nosedived. Uh, I had to go to the hospital, had a high fever. And I was in the hospital for, like I said, about four days, maybe five days. And on day four, I told the doctor, I said, when am I getting out of here? And he said, listen, if you'd come in here a day later, you'd be leaving sooner, but you'd be going out the back door. That's how perilous it was for me because my body couldn't fight off the pneumonia. Even when I got home for the next uh, week and a half or two weeks or so, I just had trouble turning side to side in bed. I uh, couldn't breathe uh, very well, but a strange thing happened. You know, my strength coach called me uh, about two weeks. Uh, like I said, after I got out of the hospital, he said, hey, you want to start running again? And I said, sure. And the first time I got back in the gym, and, and mind you, the, before I got my pneumonia, I could run one or two of these deep fives. I had to run five of them. I could run one or two, but I would need about three or four minutes of rest in between. I mean, you only got a minute, so I was way off. I mean, I wasn't even close. So when I got out of the hospital, my first time I ran four of them with a minute in between. I don't know how I did it. I call it divine intervention. Uh, but a few weeks later, I was able to pass and then start practicing with the team. So that was another thing that I had to accomplish and, and get over where I had to get over the hump and finally be able to practice. Uh, and I wanna say one more thing because Harold is so humble. Uh, and he doesn't consider himself a hero, but you know, special people, Chris, lots of times they don't think they're so special. And, and that's what makes uh, them special. You know, they, they're not full of themselves. They don't realize uh, their great acts. And we have so many people nowadays that are considered celebrities uh, because they're famous, but a hero is a person who's defined by his action, who actually does a heroic deed. And you can't discount what Harold did. I don't want him to discount what he did because uh, it, you know, my first couple of years going to the transplant games and even now I hear people say, oh, I don't know if I could do that. And you know, uh, my, my brother needs a kidney and I just don't know. And there are a lot of people that don't want to step up even with the knowledge that we have today that don't have the courage. And so I, I don't care what he says, I still consider him a hero. I do too. He's a special guy indeed. And Harold, on that note, I'm coming back to you. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you for the 20 year anniversary uh, liver design moccasins. Those are sweet. I love them. <laughs> I'll tell my kid to say that. I've got little livers on them. They're great. Um, I want to ask you going into this process, we have a, a dear friend and board member, Bob Wade, who lost his son, Robbie, in a skateboarding accident and uh, donated all of uh, Robbie's organs and saved uh, quite a few lives and had a real positive impact on, on many people. And I sat down uh, as a recipient with Bob afterwards and uh, he said, well, I, I would love to know where, where Robbie's organs went. And did you know right away uh, who your recipient was going to be? And did you have a desire to meet them? And, and what was sort of going on in your head? Because as a recipient, I was really conflicted because I was so grateful to receive the second chance at life, but I know at what cost that came. And in your case with living donation, I'm sure you were curious as well to not only know where your kidney went, but how that other, how that recipient was doing. Yeah, good question. So uh, at the time, 20 years ago, and I think even today, if you're a non-designated donor, uh, one of the rules is you can't know male, female, young, old, black, white, Hispanic, somebody's getting it who's on the top of the I need it list. Uh, and so I was only in the hospital two days. And as they uh, kicked me out, the last thing they asked me was, hey, if both the donor and the recipient are uh, up for it, 
we'll introduce you, you know, in a couple months when everybody's healed, would you want to do that? And at the time I was like, sure. It's like, why would I read a book and not finish the last chapter? I, I want to know. Uh, but then uh, two months passed and they called up and said, we're putting that meeting together so you can meet the recipient. Uh, and I said, I changed my mind. I'd rather not. And they kind of freaked out a little bit. They said, why? And I said, well, look, I didn't do this for somebody to say thank you. My, my reasons are personal. And they said, well, OK. And the real reason that I didn't share was I think it was a great story. It was a perfect fairy tale. And if you, research had told me that uh, in, in the D.C. area and probably nationally, a lot of the people on the waiting list are, are, are African-American. And my fear was what happens if this person looks at me? Now, they probably wouldn't. But if they looked at me and went, ew, that would so screw up this good story. And so I said, I'd rather not. And then they, they they understood and they came back to me three days later and go, we spoke to the recipient uh, and she, all she wants to do is meet you to thank your family. They don't want anything. Just want to say thanks. And so we agreed to do it. One of the better decisions I've, I've ever made. Uh, but so I hope that answers the question. That's great. And, and do you maintain a, a relationship with your recipient well, sure. today? Do you get uh, birthday cards or... Uh... Yeah, I send my my kidney a birthday card uh, every year, and whenever I get back to the D.C. area, we get together for a, an Ethiopian feast. It's wonderful. I love it. Dr. Kokarni, I want to ask you uh, one more question, and then I'll uh, pass it over to Lauren and uh, see if we have any questions from the chat. But uh, what kind of trends or, or attitude changes are you seeing uh, more recently or the last couple of years? Um, in terms of, of living donation? Yeah, so there are several, but if I may comment a little bit on what, what Harold was getting at about the hero issue, uh, I, I think living donors are heroes as well. Uh, but I do also a lot of um, research on people who've donated or who are going to donate. And I think the point he's trying to make is that not everyone wants to be a living donor, right? You have a select population and um, they just feel naturally compelled to do it. And sometimes that hero label uh, both makes them feel uncomfortable and then also sets a bar for society that many people who may have donated don't think that they're necessarily a hero. So we've seen that a lot in our research actually. And uh, I think based on some of the things that Harold said, which is correct regarding the, uh, the increase in social media, uh, we feel like the solution really here is the normalization of living donation um, to, I mean, we probably will never get there, but, you know, for example, donating blood is a normal thing. Nobody's going to question why you would donate blood, right? Uh, people question a lot whether you're going to donate a kidney or a portion of your liver, right? Uh, there are people who uh, get information or misinformation and they sort of propagate it. Uh, and it, sometimes it does take a hero's task to overcome that. As a society, if we can get to a point where that's far more normal, um, I think far more people uh, would be comfortable moving forward with donating. So I really got exactly what he said. I, I think he's a hero too, but from uh, from a perspective of what's the right thing for us as far as uh, improving awareness of living donation, we should try to normalize it because frankly, donors do pretty well. Uh, as far as new innovations, um, the, the main one really nowadays is exchanges. And I don't know if, if you're familiar with that, but the first thing that people typically ask somebody who is a potential donor is, what's your blood type, right? Are you a match, right? People want to know your match. And nowadays, more and more, um, that just doesn't matter because you have platforms where, let's say you have somebody who wants to donate a kidney to you, uh, for example. Um, I'm primarily a kidney surgeon. Um, and they're a different blood type. Well, uh, that doesn't really matter anymore. As long as you have somebody who's come forward to willing to donate to you, we have several individuals who have willing donors, but they're different blood types, and we swap them. So on any given day, you, you won't donate to somebody who you wanted to donate because you're not a match. You'll donate to somebody else. But in exchange for that, uh, your recipient will get a living donor transplant. 
five to seven years of waiting time. At the end of the day, that's what people want to donate. They want to have a good result. So uh, there's several programs that the National Kidney Registry is a national program, probably the largest, based out of New York who organizes these. Uh, many centers do them internally as well. Uh, but matching is simply not a barrier anymore. As long as you have somebody coming forward to be a willing donor, be a willing, uh, willing donor, living donor, and they're healthy enough, we can make it happen for you. Anything else you want to share on uh, living donation? Maybe somebody that's thinking about it and not sure, or maybe somebody that that watches this broadcast live, or maybe in the days or weeks ahead, come across it and say, "Living donation? Are you nuts? What yeah. is there anything uh, anything that you share to somebody that's kind of learning about it for the first time, or maybe has been thinking about it for a while?" The the thing I encourage people is simply get the information primarily from a transplant center. There's no pressure. A lot of it is education, education, education. But unfortunately, there's a lot of in misinformation on the internet. So, uh, and we realize that. So, uh, but if you were to simply participate in an educational session, and a lot of transplant programs will do that. Like, you're not sure you wanna go through the evaluation, you just wanna sit in, uh, on an hour or two hour long education session, get the real data and then make an informed choice. There, there's no transplant center in the country who's gonna wanna take an organ uh, that you don't wanna give, trust me. <laughs> Understood, good advice. Hey Lauren, do we have any questions from the chat or any uh, questions that you'd like to put forth before I give all of our panelists a chance to uh, share their closing comments? Yeah, um, actually, if all the panelists will turn on your cameras, this is the point where we want to see everyone. And then the first question is pretty timely and um, to Dr. Kalkarni. Doug has asked, how has COVID-19 impacted Yale's living donation program? So initially, it impacted it pretty dramatically. So um, in April, May, and June, we actually shut down our living donor program. Um, I'm obviously, we were obviously in the Northeast, uh, which was hit first. And it really had to do with, um, you know, uh, resources. So uh, the, uh, the intensive care units and the beds were just, the utilization was so high, it was hard to justify um, doing a living donor transplant. And we, our hope was it was only going to be delayed for three or four months. And, and truth and fact, in starting in July, we, 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 we started doing living donor transplants. So I think from a health priority perspective, it's all going to be dependent on, let's say there's another surge or whatever happens, what's the ICU utilization, what's the bed utilization. We also want to make sure that it's a safe environment uh, for people coming to the hospital to get an operation. Um, but it, luckily, it has been temporary. We're back up to speed. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kalkarni. I wanted to remind everybody in attendance, too, that this is the opportunity to raise your hand and ask a question as well. But we do have a question for Harold from Stacy. She wanted to know, she's been going through um, questions, asking herself if she wants to be a donor. She wanted to know your perspective of what were the questions that you asked yourself in preparation for donation? Uh yeah, that's a really good question, Stacy. So uh, it's the most obvious questions I kept and I have in my scrapbook. Uh, first of all, the big one is, uh, will I wake up from surgery? As as with any kind of surgery, there's, there's slight risk, but uh, I think the number is only one out of 3,000 people won't wake up from that surgery, which didn't freak me out too much. Will I still be able to drink? Will I still be able to eat red meat? Will I still be able, how big will the scar be? And you know, all standard questions, but as they kept coming back, I kept saying, well, that's okay. That's not a problem. And uh, I find myself in a position now, I call it a kidney coach, uh, because as we've heard, oftentimes potential donors don't want to ask questions of the recipient or the family. There's too much pressure there. They go to outside sources for information. Uh, I've raised my hand and have coached 50 uh, kidney donors beforehand to kind of go through what's it going to be like, what are you going to feel, and as much as everyone's different, 
there are shared uh, experiences uh, that make sense. So I hope that hope that answers it a little bit. Lauren, if we don't have any more questions, I'd love to uh, give each of our panelists, maybe Jordan, starting with you, an opportunity just to share anything that you maybe wanted to talk about for a minute today regarding living donation and your experience that might be helpful uh, to our conversation that uh, maybe I didn't cover. I uh, did my best to help facilitate a good conversation that was entertaining and, and helpful for anyone uh, that is presented with living donation on the recipient or donor side. But uh, if there's something I left out, this is uh, your chance to share it. I, I think you did a great job. You covered a lot of it. <laughs> um, no, I, I was just going to say that I, I love the different perspectives. Even as a panelist, I, I mean, I'm learning from you guys too, from the other panelists. So I appreciate you guys um, sharing your story and your perspective. Um, I just have my perspective in terms of being um, the mother of a recipient. So um, thank you for everything that you guys are doing and um, raising awareness. And I think that the message that pretty much all of you guys said um, in terms of reaching out, um, I think that was pretty consistent. So if you guys have questions, reach out. Um, and and I, I think that you're going to find that you have a huge support system. So that's, thank you for kind of echoing all of that. You bet. Good luck to uh, Hudson too. Wish him well for us and uh, hope <laughs> he's you. doing well and staying healthy. Thank you. Harold, anything you want to share uh, in closing? We've covered most of it. I guess uh, uh, Dr. Kulkarni said something oh. that I think is is perfect. Uh, which is uh, normalizing uh, the decision to be a donor. Uh, again, let's keep the, the high, those high words of praise out of the conversation for a minute. Right now, there's a lot of people that are looking for help, whether it's from a family member or from friends or coworkers. And so uh, I, I would encourage you to start asking questions. That's the best part. Uh, ask questions, get the answers, and if it makes sense, ask more. If it freaks you out and you don't want to go any further, don't. But uh, the normalization of this conversation is where it all starts. Good advice. Thank Chris, you, Harold. Chris, I'm back. Uh, I apologize. Uh, My computer no died. We do have more questions coming in. Um, okay. And a hand raised. So actually, let me go to... Um, I'll ask this question from L. My husband donated his kidney to me. We have one negative pushback on his family side. Did you deal with similar issues as a recipient and as a donor, and how did you deal with it? And I'm not sure who that question was directed to, but I believe L is on, and we can have her um, answer. Yep, L, you are now unmuted. Can you ask the question to the panelists? Hi, how are you? <laughs> Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Um, so a couple of years ago, I received a double lung transplant and I also received a kidney transplant. Um, my husband was a donor. So at the time we had some pushback and negative feedback from one of our family members. And I just wanted to know if either the recipients on this panel or you, Harold, um, as a donor, did you experience any similar feedback from your families or friends? And how did you handle it in, um, at the time? Yeah, so first of all, my younger brother uh, today, remember I donated 20 years ago, but today he's diabetic. Uh, and he was on the path to that 20 years ago. And when I kind of announced to the family, here's my plans, I'm gonna be donating, he quickly called me up and said, hey, you know, I'm." I'm a potential diabetic, I'm pre-diabetic, and there's a good chance that down the road, I might need a kidney. And my response was swift. And I said, if you need one today, I'm happy to give it to you today. But right now you don't need it and somebody else does. I said, if the day comes when you ever need one, I've got a lot of friends and you've got a lot of friends and our family is, good, is big. I think we'll be able to find one for you when the time comes. Now, uh, fortunately that never came to pass. And as far as friends go, a vast majority of my friends were, what a great idea, good for you. A couple of them took a different path and said, how can you do this to your family? And I answered the same way I answered my brother. If something comes up today, I'll address it today, but why cross a bridge that you might never ever come to? So 
I don't know if that helps. Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, did anybody else on the panel want to touch on that question before we move to the other one, the next one? No. Okay. Doc, do you, um, uh, Doc, do you get any uh, negative feedback? related to I, I shouldn't say neg negativity but more so questions that uh it, related to living donation that are that are very challenging and perhaps paint it not a positive light in any way and how do you deal with that yeah it, it's more common than not honestly and it just comes from the fact that that again not everyone is compelled to come forward to be a living donor so the people that that don't understand it, um, have a hard time reconciling those issues, right? So particularly then with their family members, they think that somebody's making a mistake. Uh, but a lot of it comes from misinformation, uh, getting information through, you know, word of mouth or rumors or the internet, unfortunately. Uh, but it is a very frequent thing. Um, and I think, we're trying to change that in the transplant community through education. I wish we would have done that 20 years ago, honestly. I think we'd be in a different place right now. Um, but it is very, very common that you have, I, I, I can go through the list of, you know, you're gonna be off of work for a year, you're not gonna be able to get pregnant, you know, uh, over and over again, there's a lot of these different, these different uh, <clears throat> issues that come up and it's oftentimes, <clears throat> excuse me, family members, and they understandably care about the person, their family members, and they're trying to protect them. But um, if they were really educated, they'd be more supportive. And one of the things that we want to make sure is when somebody does donate, that they do it in a supportive atmosphere. Well said. Thank you, Doc. Lauren, um, do you have another question? We do, and I think it's also to Dr. Kulkarni, um, but I looked up a quick known fact. The question was, what age is too old to be a live living donor? But um, the oldest donor was 107 years old in Scotland. In US, uh, it was 92 years old. But um, to you, Dr. Kalkarni, what age is too old to be a live donor? So it's different from liver and kidney. Um, and it, most transplant programs uh, for liver donation have a cutoff of about 55 to 60. Um, there are several reasons for that. Um, for a kidney donation, it's typically, there's no age cutoff per se, but you have to understand that as we age, your kidney function generally goes down because your need goes down uh, over a period of time. So uh, uniformly, transplant programs will measure uh, kidney function through a 24-hour urine collection that's very specific and is very accurate. And if it doesn't meet a particular threshold, um, you can't donate. But there's no specific age cutoff. Uh, the oldest donor we've done here has been 73. The, it was a, a spouse transplant. They did very, very well. Um, but that tends to be more rare. The living donors tend to be uh, younger. Um. I think this is a great question to kind of um, wrap up, but this question was going out to everyone. How can we educate and encourage people to become living organ donors? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in with the most obvious. This event right here is a way to make it normal, ask questions about it, spread the word. Uh, I think nobody, talks about organ donation unless they're forced to talk about organ donation. Either they or a family member or a friend needs something. Uh, I think when these kind of conversations happen, it doesn't normalize it, but it makes it less odd maybe for somebody to ask those questions. So that's good. I would say the same thing. And, uh, you know, I did a uh, something similar to this uh, actually last month. And the question was posed, uh, to me because it uh, concerned the black community and the uh, lack of trust that the black community has with the medical community. And uh, for me, 
Uh, my answer back then was we need to build trust between the black community and the health, uh, the medical community, because that distrust leads to uh, so many people that are reluctant to come forward and donate or try to help somebody else out or even seek treatment. And so I know it's a small part of what we're talking about, but um, I would say uh, educating people, building trust, having more events uh, just like this. I mean, here I am uh, 21 years out and uh, I'm learning from Harold and Dr. Kolkarni, uh, you know, about different attitudes uh, when it comes to uh, uh, live donation. And so uh, this has been informative for me as well. And, I, and trust me, I thought I knew it all. So uh, this is, you know, more events like this uh, go a long ways toward uh, getting the message out. So maybe I'll chime in and let Jordan finish. Uh, I think a, a big part of this, honestly, is giving also support to recipients. I don't think we understand how difficult it is when you're sick uh, to ask somebody to do this for them. Um, sometimes people who have a strong family network, it's far easier. Um, for other people, it's hard. <laughs> you know, you're asking somebody to go through an operation and maybe they should not be the ones asking. Maybe we need to have a, a, a support structure where, you know, we can get the word out a little bit on, on somebody who needs a transplant. And you never know who's gonna come forward, but one of the things that we've realized is that regardless of education on the recipient side, you know, they're going through a hard time. They're sick, uh, they, they're, they're, they could have financial issues dealing with their job. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're under so much stress to then say, go out and get a living donor. It's, it's really easier said than done. So we need to support that a little bit more. Jordan, you want to add a comment? I mean, that was like the perfect segue. Um, I was going to say, along with what Harold and Sean were saying in terms of normalizing it all, um, I, I think that, I mean, Hudson is young, right? He's turning four, so we are his advocates. But I think you bring up a great point um, where the support system for asking um, and is huge. And I think that part of that too is um, understanding because the recipient or whomever is going through um, their organ disease, um, they are sick. They don't really understand everything that's going on. It's a lot of information to take in. Um, so I think that um, empowering that support system, I think that's going to be huge. So I completely agree. I gave Jordan and uh, Harold a chance to kind of share their final thoughts. Uh, Sean, do you want to share anything uh, as we wrap up? No, I, I think um, I, I, I've probably said enough and taken up too much time. Uh, but I, you know, this is a great uh, this is a great thing you're doing here, Chris. And uh, you know, <clears throat> you just keep pounding away. You know, we have this saying. Uh, in the Spurs organization, it's about pounding the rock and you keep pounding and pounding uh, until that rock breaks. And, you know, it's not the final blow that does it, uh, does it. it's all the, the blows that have come before. So this is just one more blow uh, to the rock and we just keep hammering away and hammering away until uh, we get the message across. I love that. Thanks, Sean. Uh, Doc, do you want to uh, help us wrap this up here as far as uh, any final comments you want to share and uh, as it relates to living donation? Well, I, I think I've mentioned it before. I mean, I think what people re need to recognize is this is something that uh, should be a societal aim, right? Chronic illness and chronic organ failure are a huge burden to individuals and to society. Uh, and you can look at every single layer, psychosocial, financial, healthcare, all that kind of stuff. And in a real sense, it's a, a fixable problem because we, we have, we're pretty good at it from a surgical perspective nowadays. The donors do really well and so do recipients. So, um, and every single time a living donor comes forward to uh, donate, just remember they're pulling that person from the list. Right, so the person behind them is now moving forward. 
So every single time a living donor comes forward, you're actually, it's not just a impact to one individual, it's the impact to the overall goal of fixing the problem of end-stage organ failure. Well, before I uh, turn it over to Lauren to wrap it up, I just wanna say thanks to uh, all of you for joining us today, for taking uh, an hour and 20 minutes out of your day to help us spread the word and, and help uh, people better understand living donation and, and organ donation in general. And uh, yeah, I just wanna say thanks for all you guys do to give back to the transplant community. Thanks for uh, helping support CKF and, and our mission. And uh, everyone stay healthy. Love you guys and uh, stay healthy. And I look forward to hopefully getting together in person when we get the other side of uh, all this COVID stuff. And also just real quickly, I wanna say thanks to Lauren uh, Pierce, our executive director and to CeCe Cunningham, our program director and to uh, all the hard work they put into organizing this. Thanks to our friends at Novartis for helping sponsor this and uh, making this whole ambassador tour possible as we uh, pivot in this new paradigm we're living in, but we'll all get through it together. Thanks for that, Chris, and thanks all the panelists and everyone that's joined us. Um, next month's webinar will actually be focused on um, COVID and our resource uh, website. And then um, it's on November 19th. And if you've just thought of questions that you want answered, we ask that you submit them in the comments section in the survey you'll receive after the webinar ends. We want to equip you with all the information we can during this time and wherever you might be in your transplant journey, but we can only do that if you let us know how we can help. The recording of today's webinar will be available at chrisklugfoundation.org and our new COVID-19 transplant resource website. We hope you have a great day. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks.